A mystery that cannot be explained. An enigma that defies reason. A surprising and unexpected answer. To encounter such a mystery firsthand may change your life forever. Face to face with the greatest riddles of the ages, the world's most profound mysteries reach out and touch your life in ways you never imagined possible. Extreme Mysteries. The Gospels record only one major event in the childhood of Jesus. It happened when he was 12 years old and went to the temple in Jerusalem with his parents. This was an important time in the life of a young Jewish boy. He became a bar mitzvah, a son of the law. Could it be that this is when the ministry of Jesus really began? Joseph of Arimathea is believed by many to have been the uncle of Mary. He was a worldly and wealthy merchant. Is it possible that as a son of the law, Jesus accompanied him in his travels during the missing years? The key to understanding the tradition of Jesus in England was in fact Joseph of Arimathea. It is the ruins of the Glastonbury Abbey still standing that provides the strongest link between history and legend. It is believed the ruins cover the site of the little mud and wattle house built by Jesus and his uncle Joseph. This is the church whose very foundations may have been laid by Christ himself. If the missing years are in fact missing, why are they missing? Did something happen during those years that could change the essential nature of Christianity? Is it possible that Jesus took his message to the world before he brought it to his own people? Was Joseph of Arimathea his mentor and guide? A startling journey is just ahead. Bar Mitzvah was an important occasion for a young Jewish boy and would have been anticipated with respect. This designation meant that he would have less supervision and more freedom to move about. It is not beyond the realm of possibility that Joseph of Arimathea would have made preparations for the boy's education. But Joseph and Mary must have wondered if they had given him too much freedom. At the evening encampment of the first day on the journey back to Nazareth, they discovered he was missing and had no choice but to return to Jerusalem and search for him. This episode strongly suggests that Jesus had deliberately stayed behind after the others had left. We can't escape the impression that he knew that he must be about his father's business in his father's house. The record indicates that Joseph and Mary found him after three days, which would tell us that he had a rather long dialogue with the learned men of his day. In the scripture, what was discussed is summed up by the statement that all that heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. Prior to his baptism, Jesus perhaps expressed his divinity at the temple when he confounded the wise sages teaching there and he said, don't you know that I must be about my father's business? Perhaps in my, the emphasis on my father, we have a hint at Jesus' own understanding of who he was. This is the last reference in the scriptures to Jesus as a child or young man. He will next appear at the River Jordan at age 30, asking John to baptize him. Where was he during those 18 years? Surely if he was about his father's business, wouldn't he have been preparing in some way for his ministry? The lack of direct biblical information about Jesus' early manhood has puzzled scholars for centuries. However, Bible scholars now know enough from scripture, from archaeology, and from the underlying culture of Israel in the first century to provide us with a respectable grasp of these years. It's not a stretch of the imagination to say that they are no longer silent years. There seems to be little dispute among modern theologians that Jesus spent most, if not all, of those intervening years in Nazareth, following his father's trade. But Luke gives us something very intriguing to ponder. He tells us that Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. 
How much opportunity could there have been for a young carpenter in the obscure village of Nazareth to grow in wisdom or attain favor and stature among men? Based on recent archaeological and historic data, it's now believed by many Christian scholars that Jesus did not arrive on the scene out of obscurity and totally unknown. In fact, many knowledgeable scholars now believe that Jesus had a certain degree of visibility and recognition. The idea that Jesus was simply a small town boy is no longer viable. He was much more in touch with the urban world in which he lived and closer to contemporary issues than has been traditionally assumed. Jesus didn't burst full grown on the political and religious landscape of Israel. It's true that the unique culture and geographic location of Nazareth was pivotal to the formation of his early years, and we can learn much from it, but that's only a partial picture of Jesus' life. Archaeological work as far back as 1931 suggests that Jesus could very well have been the product of a sophisticated, urban, cosmopolitan, imperial Roman metropolis, the first century city of Sephoris just a 45-minute walk from his home in Nazareth. In Sepphoris, you had a heterogeneous society in which paganism came face to face with traditional Judaism and all the temptations of the big city, the theater, the bathhouse, the gymnasium were there to try to draw children away from their Jewish traditional roots. Jesus' vocation was rabbi, but his business was craftsman, a successful carpenter and artisan craftsman which he pursued until A.D. 26 or 27. He and Joseph were among the estimated 10,000 craftsmen, which the historian Josephus says were employed by Herod Antipas in intensive building activities in Sephoris. Here the apocryphal literature adds some insight. According to one story, the king called upon Joseph to build a chair upon which he could sit while conducting the business of the state, a throne as it were. Completing his work would indeed give the carpenter and his son great stature among men. According to the apocryphal literature, when the chair was finished, Joseph, to his anguish, discovered that this chair was two spans too narrow. Joseph was devastated. He knew the king would be furious, but worse, his reputation as a skilled carpenter and builder would be totally destroyed. But Jesus told Joseph, there's nothing to worry about. They would simply make the chair the right size. With Joseph on one side and Jesus on the other, they pulled it into a perfect fit. Certainly a carpenter who could satisfy a king would be in great demand for other projects, such as the project in Sepphoris that was going on at that time. Sepphoris was a magnificent urban culture and puts Jesus in a setting far different than most people expect for him. When we look at Jesus' ministry, we find that it's cosmopolitan in nature. The commercial metaphors in his parables indicate that he had contact with urban life more than most people imagine. Our idea that Jesus was just a country boy is no longer valid. Today we can say that Jesus was much more aware of his urban environment, his cultural setting, and the current events than we would have ever imagined before. There can be no doubt that the lives of Jesus and Herod Antipas did indeed intersect during this significant period. By the time Jesus began his ministry as an itinerant rabbi, he had not only received the thorough religious training typical of many Jewish men in his day, he had probably spent years studying with one of the outstanding sages in Galilee. There is another story. What if Jesus didn't spend his time in Nazareth, studying with learned rabbis and helping to build the city of Sephoris? Where could he have been taught? There are those who believe it was here, among the Essenes of ancient Qumran. Our history of the Essenes really comes from two different sources. The historians on one side, like Pliny the Elder, Philo of Alexandria and the Roman apologist uh, Josephus Flavius. And then we have ancient texts which survive into our day like the Dead Sea Scrolls. However, to place Jesus amongst the Essenes is a little bit more difficult. According to Philo, the Essenes were vegetarians. However, Jesus condoned the practice of eating meat. On the other hand, the Essenes practiced baptism in water 
the sharing of the sacred meal and prayer, which clearly survived in our modern Christianity. There's a small number of scholars that suggest that Jesus was a student at the Qumran community, uh, simply because he existed during the same time that that settlement uh, existed. Is there any proof for such a forced hypothesis that Jesus actually learned Qumran doctrine? Uh, there is no proof, not even a small amount of proof, there's no proof whatsoever. But was there more than one Essene community? Could it be that here at Mount Carmel, little more than a stone's throw from Nazareth, Jesus found the deeply religious teachings that shaped his ministry? Today at Mount Carmel, there is a Catholic monastic order called the White Friars. The order was established in the 12th century, and according to tradition, the friars wear white robes in honor of the ancient Essene order. The friars believe that Jesus was an Essene raised at Mount Carmel. There's no end to the theories and scholarly supposition about what Jesus was doing from age 12 until his baptism by John at age 30. Is there evidence that Jesus was anything but a carpenter, living his life as a traditional Jew until his ministry began? Scripturally, that's all the evidence we have. The scriptures are indeed silent as to the specific activities of Jesus during those 18 years. There are traditions, however, some of them very old, when coupled with Luke's assurance that he grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men, seems to suggest he was doing something of significance. But what could it have been? Could he have found his way to Tibet, India, and China? Have investigators, theologians, and archaeologists discovered evidence that Jesus actually journeyed to the British Isles with his great uncle, Joseph of Arimathea? And is it possible that that same evidence will lead us to the artifact that launched the Great Crusades, the Holy Grail, some astounding chronicles, when we return? Lacking any direct scriptural contradiction, some scholars and investigators have proposed a wide variety of answers to the question of Jesus' whereabouts during what have been called the Silent Years. One of the most persistent of these chronicles was introduced not by a scholar or researcher, but by a Russian journalist. In 1887, Nicholas Nodovich, a Russian war correspondent traveling through India, heard a monk refer to the Grand Lama named Isa, the Tibetan word for Jesus. The holy man Isa had apparently preached the same doctrine in India and Tibet that was later preached in Israel. There was a scroll, the monk said, written in the Tibetan language that Notovich eventually had translated and the text of which he personally arranged in the proper chronological order. According to the scroll, Notovich said Jesus had wandered to India and Tibet before he began his work in Palestine. Here Jesus learned the Vedas, how to cure by aid of prayer, and how to drive out evil spirits. Uh, the book was roundly criticized, and in an interview with the Grand Lama, where the book was allegedly housed, Archibald Douglas was told that no such book existed. But when Archibald read portions of the book back to the Grand Lama, the Grand Lama turned and shouted, lies, lies, all lies. But then in 1926, the book was republished and hailed by the press as a new and important discovery. It managed to find some supporters, and though we've never been able to find the actual book or verify that Notovich's translation was real, the story's been around with us ever since. Although the New Testament does not directly address the issue, there are strong indications that Jesus never traveled east. First, he was known as a carpenter and as a carpenter's son. Both Matthew and Mark refer to this. What's more, the people in and around Nazareth appear to be very familiar with Jesus, as if they had regular contact with him over a long period of time. Luke tells us Jesus went to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and he went to the synagogue, as was his custom, where he read and taught the scriptures. This implies that those in the synagogue regarded Jesus as a local resident. Matthew says they ask, isn't this the carpenter's son? And isn't his mother's name Mary? But if Jesus didn't travel east, could he have traveled west to the green pastures and tin mines of a Druid-dominated England? And how would he have gotten there? The key to understanding the history of Jesus in England is in fact Joseph of Arimathea. 
According to the Talmud, Joseph of Arimathea was much more than just a friend to Christ, he was Mary's uncle. And the young Jesus in his early years was reported to have traveled extensively with his great uncle. The earliest traditions associated with Glastonbury, England date back to the 5th century in the Landau Charters and cannot be dismissed out of hand. For example, even those religious teachers in India who taught that Jesus taught amongst the Himalayan communities in Nepal said he went on to the sacred isles, to Britistan. The earliest traditions of Glastonbury center around the person of Joseph of Arimathea, who is also referred to as Nobilis de Curion. In the Roman world, the de Curion was in charge of a mining district. One tradition has Joseph coming to Britain, visiting Cornwall and Somerset counties, which at that time was the center of the mining of lead, tin, and copper for the Roman world. The scriptures give us very little information about Joseph of Arimathea. We are told only that he was a secret disciple of Jesus and that he was a very rich man. Inexplicably, however, it is Joseph of Arimathea who was given permission to bury Christ's body in his own tomb. Could it be that Joseph was more than just a pitying friend? At the crucifixion scene, Joseph, who had been married to the Virgin Mary, was nowhere to be found. It was Joseph of Arimathea who took the body of Christ down off the cross and put it in his own family crypt. This is further evidence that Joseph of Arimathea was, in fact, the great uncle of Christ. A casual reading of the account leads us to believe that Joseph claimed the body of Christ on the grounds that he was a casual friend or follower of Jesus. And this is highly unlikely, however. The chief priests had already made special arrangements with Pilate regarding the security of the body of Jesus, especially to keep it out of the hands of the followers of Jesus. Joseph of Arimathea had both the full rights to the body under Jewish law and Roman law, but the full responsibility for the body as Jesus' nearest relative and protector, which is evidence of the relationship between Jesus and Joseph of Arimathea as his great uncle. Is it possible that Joseph of Arimathea took the young Jesus with him on his travels to Great Britain? And do we have any evidence to suggest Jesus was not in Palestine or Judea for an extended period of time? Two events recorded in the Bible seem to suggest that Jesus was away from Israel for some period of time before he began his ministry. When John the Baptist met Jesus at the River Jordan, many believe that he didn't recognize him until they had spoken. This could mean they had not seen each other for a long time. They should have seen each other at least during the three main feasts required by the Mosaic Law. We also know that Jesus and his family made annual visits to Jerusalem every year. Matthew tells us that when Jesus arrived at Capernaum, Peter was asked by the tax collector if his master had to pay the temple tax. The tax collector, who apparently knew Jesus, wasn't certain if he had to pay or not. And many believe that this implies a long absence from Galilee. Again, tradition is the only source that brings Jesus as a young man to the shores of Great Britain. But these traditions are strongly held by those who have received them from generation after generation. Are we then justified in assuming that Jesus came to Glastonbury with his uncle, Joseph of Arimathea, and stayed for some period of time? There are several traditions that support the story of Jesus being in Glastonbury. The parish church of Pretty, high on the Mendips, have an old saying that goes, as sure as our Lord was at Pretty. And the school children at Pretty sing a song. It says, Joseph was in the tin trade, the tin trade. And it goes on to tell of him arriving in a boat. The uh, parish church of Pretty, not too far from Glastonbury, they have a banner that shows Christ, his boy, on a boat with his uncle, arriving in Glastonbury. It is the ruins of the Glastonbury Abbey still standing that provides the strongest link between history and legend. It is believed the ruins cover the site of the little mud and wattle house built by Jesus and his uncle Joseph. For centuries, it has been considered a holy shrine and countless thousands of persons have visited Glastonbury. 
Originally known as the Isle of Avon, because of the extensive marsh that surrounded these hills, Glastonbury's history goes back to the time of King Arthur. In fact, there is little doubt that the Glastonbury Abbey is the oldest religious foundation in the British Isles. But does that constitute historical evidence that Jesus was here? No written record survived the great fire of 1184 that destroyed the Glastonbury Abbey and its priceless library. St. Augustine, who visited Glastonbury, known then as Avalon, in AD 600, wrote a letter to Pope Gregory and stated that he saw a church constructed by no human art, but by the hands of Christ himself for the salvation of his people, and added that the people there were already Christians. The traditions teach that Joseph of Arimathea also returned to Glastonbury after the crucifixion and brought with him eleven companions and the cup of the Last Supper, the fabled Holy Grail, containing actual blood from the crucifixion. Could there be any truth in this story? There are two other traditions that give this spot special significance. Upon arrival, Joseph is said to have thrust his staff into the ground on this hill. It sprouted and brought to England the sturdy blooming thorn trees found in the area. This is said to be descended from the original tree. An ages-old custom involves taking a cutting from a thorn tree each Christmas and presenting it to the reigning monarch. Queen Elizabeth II is now the recipient of this ancient custom. The importance of Glastonbury is also enhanced by the tradition that says Joseph buried the Holy Grail there. This olive wood cup can be traced to the destruction of the Glastonbury Abbey, but can it be traced to Jerusalem? Is it possible that the cup of the Last Supper came to England with Joseph of Arimathea? The Glastonbury traditions are so strong that the ruins are used today for religious purposes. Here in the ruins of Mary's Chapel, believed to have been built over the original Waddle Church built by Jesus himself, an annual ceremony of rededication to Christ is held each year. This is the church whose very foundations may have been laid by Christ himself. Legend and tradition have long been scorned by theologians and scholars alike, but at least one of the early church historians and philosophers, St. Augustine, seems to have given the story some credence. In a letter to Pope Gregory, written around 600 A.D., he wrote, In the western confines of Britain, there is a certain royal island of large extent, surrounded by water and abounding in all the beauties of nature and the necessaries of life. In it, the first neophytes of Catholic law found a church constructed by no human art, but by the hands of Christ himself. Did Jesus leave the Holy Land as a young man? and travel to distant parts of the world? Did Joseph of Arimathea bring Mary and the Holy Grail to England following the crucifixion? Could it be that Jesus was indeed at Pretty? Many of the traditions appear to be in direct contradiction with the scriptures, but there are some that give us pause. For example, what was it that convinced St. Augustine that Jesus really was on the Isle of Avalon? Researchers, scientists, archaeologists and theologians still vigorously pursue answers to all of these questions. And perhaps someday, some new discovery will come to light and give us yet another glimpse into this remarkable life. But for now at least, the lost years of Jesus remain lost.